So <laughs> before we dive into God's word in just a moment, um, we're gonna have a word of prayer and let's allow God to block out our distractions. Father in heaven, as we get ready to open up your holy word, your very word spoken to us, Father, we pray that your spirit would give sight to our eyes, ears to hear. And Father, we want nothing more today than for your spirit to minister to us in only the way we, you can, knowing that you are good and faithful and that you will do a work of grace. It's in your name we pray, amen. And so we are continuing our series, Ruth, A Christmas Story. And so how many of you guys have been enjoying this series so far this year? You guys been enjoying it? We pray that it has been a blessing to you and your family. And so, tis the season to be jolly is full and swing, right? There is Christmas all around. Everywhere you look, starting in January, you'll see Christmas decorations for the new year, right? It seems like every year it gets sooner and sooner. And we've heard that Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year, right? I like to call it the busiest and the craziest time of the year because there's so many things that have to get done in our busy lives. And you see the busyness begin on Black Friday. Any Black Friday shoppers in the house today? Okay, people that are, you're crazy, first of all, because my wife and family, they got up way before 5 a.m. And I don't, you know, I'm, I don't like to get up before 5 a.m. unless I have to. And so for them to get up and go out shopping, and then nowadays, because of Black Friday and how crazy people are, you have to wear protective gear because you might catch an elbow from somebody. And so it's just a crazy season we're in. And so we run around doing all these things. We have to also figure out how are we going to complete our gift list. We look at our finances, look at the gifts, and say, how are we going to accomplish this this year? We ha we're busy writing Christmas cards. We're busy trying to figure out schedules so we can get together with family. Where are we going for Christmas Eve? Where are we going for Christmas? Whose house are we going to earlier? Whose party are we going to here? And we're trying to figure all these things out. We're also trying to decorate our house, the inside, the outside. We're trying to figure out Christmas programs for children. My wife had a thing at her school this past Friday, so we're there for two, three hours watching little kids sing Christmas songs. And so all this busyness happens right around this year and right around the time when the end of the year is coming. And what happens is all of these stressors take place on everybody this last part of the year, which leads me to one question. How many of you in here are tired today? And I don't just mean physically tired. How many of you from all of 2019, the stressors from January 1 all the way to today are sitting back saying, I am just tired of life this year? Could be you're tired of your finances, always struggling. Why are they always on life support? Maybe it's relationships and not just significant others. Maybe it's relationships with friends or family or coworkers where you're like, I just, I'm tired of there always being this turmoil. Maybe it's you're tired of loved ones dying around you that you care about. Maybe it's your children, you're tired of your children that have turned from God and running their own path and you're tired of seeing them walk through this difficult journey. Or maybe you're tired of your job piling work on top of you while you're your salary stays the same, or maybe you're tired of your health never fully recovering and you're constantly battling this health issue, or maybe you're sitting there saying, I have a lack of job, or maybe my house is falling apart, or maybe I'm about to lose my home and I'm tired of it, and some of us might just be tired of being tired. You with me this morning? So church, I have to admit, Kelly and I, this has been a rough 2019 for us. And this is one of those years where we were on vacation. As we're on the way back from vacation, we're like, we cannot wait for the calendar to go from 2019 to 2020 and be done with 2019. We have been tired because of the stresses of life. And I'm sure you guys have felt this way many times in your life, and maybe you feel that way this morning, and we w walk around tired, and we sit back and we say, is there one thing that we all long for, is it possible for all of us to find rest? Everybody say rest. Rest. Is it possible to even have rest? And is rest something that we can embrace and experience 
even while we are walking through the struggles and difficulties of life. Is rest possible in your biggest stressor? Is rest possible in your greatest tragedy? This morning, we're going to answer those questions, and we're going to look at the book of Ruth. So if you have the book of Ruth, I would encourage you to turn there to Ruth chapter 3, and we're going to see that rest is possible, and not only is it possible, but it is available to us today. And so if you have your notes, here's the principle that we are going to unpack this morning, and I wrote it in my notes this way, rest is found in our kinsman redeemer. Rest is found in and our kinsman redeemer. So we're going to read the first five verses right now of Ruth chapter 3. If you don't have your Bible, it will be up on the screen for you. And it says this, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek, what's that word? Rest for you, that it may be well with you. Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Last week, in the end of chapter two, we saw that Naomi points out to Ruth and says, Boaz is our kinsman redeemer. And Ruth has worked in Boaz's fields not just for one or two days. She's worked there for the whole harvest harvest season. And Naomi at this point in time says, okay, at the end of this barley season, this harvest season, it is now time for me to find rest for you, Ruth. I'm going to seek this rest for you. And the Hebrew word for rest has this idea. It's the idea of comfort, insecurity within the confines of a marriage. So in this scenario, Naomi is desiring for Ruth to find a man to marry her, provide a family, have children, which would provide comfort and security and would provide rest for her. And why did Naomi want to seek rest for Ruth? That's a great question. I'm glad you guys asked that. Here's why she wants to seek rest for Ruth. You see, women during this time did not have the same privileges as men. They were seen as inferior to men. And when Naomi's husband died, and when Ruth's husband died, and when Orpah's husband died, the man who was to carry on the name of Elimelech was no longer there. Women could not own land, could not purchase it, have possession of it, and once they lost the men in their life, they lost their land, they lost the family name, and they lost their comfort, and they lost their security. And this is why Ruth is gleaning leftovers in Boaz's lands, because they are on their own, taking care of themselves, doing what they can to provide for themselves. And to see for Naomi and to Ruth to finally have rest, They would have a peace of mind. If they could find rest, they would have a glimmer of hope that God had returned in favor to them. If they could find rest, then they would sit back and say, God hasn't forgotten about us. He's seen us in our greatest tragedy and is shining his light. If we could just find this rest, we would be able to have comfort and security. And for Naomi... This rest could not come soon enough. And now Naomi and Ruth are left at the feet of Boaz at his mercy to see whether or not he is willing to be their kinsman redeemer. So Naomi tells Ruth a couple things. She says, wash yourself, put on perfume, and change your clothes. And some people have all different kinds of theories about what kind of clothes she was wearing. Why would Naomi say this? Is this just her trying to give dating advice to Ruth? But here's the thing that I found that I think most ties in with what the text is saying here. It was a custom of those who had lost a husband to wear clothes that represented mourning. And what Naomi is telling Ruth is take off those clothes of mourning 
and put on clothes saying you are available to find rest. It is time to present yourself as someone who is able to be married. Take off those clothes of mourning. Your time of mourning is done. We are going to begin a new era to find rest. And so Ruth does that. It's a risky proposal that Naomi gives to Ruth, telling her to approach Boaz at night and lay at his feet to see whether or not he will marry her and redeem her. You see, we have to answer this question first. Who is a kinsman redeemer? And why is it important to Naomi and Ruth to have a kinsman redeemer? You see, a kinsman redeemer was something that is founded in the Old Testament law. It was something that God gave to ensure that his justice would happen among his people, that there would not be all these injustices. So these laws were given to protect that. A kinsman redeemer had a few roles. One of them was to buy back family from slavery. So they could go out, pay the price, purchase them, and bring them back into their family. Another role was they could avenge an injustice. Let's say a murder happened to their family member. They had the right, the kinsman redeemer, to go out and make sure that that justice was served for their family member. But then we come to this, this part here where it's called the Liverite marriage. And this is what God had instituted for widows. You can look all throughout scripture, you could just do a fun study later and see how much God cares about the widows, and you're going to see why this law was given. And the Leverite marriage says when a woman's husband died, it was the responsibility of the brother of the husband to marry the widow and keep the husband's name alive, keep the husband's land in possession of that family. If there was no brother to be found, it would go down the line, maybe a son, all the way down, until it found the closest relative. And the law said, this is what was required. Not a good suggestion. If you wanted to obey God and be faithful, and you were in this scenario, you would make sure that if your brother died, you would marry that widow to provide rest for her, to provide comfort, and to provide security. Now, the idea of kinsmen, I remember when I lived in North Carolina, there was this word that people repeated to me. I grew up down here in South Florida all the time, and they would always say, this is my kin, and my kin, and my kin, and I'm, I'm born and raised in Florida. The only kin I knew was a napkin, okay? And so when they're running around saying kin, I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean this is my kin? They're like, oh, this is my family. I'm like, why don't you just say that? Why don't you say this is my family? But in the Southern, kin has this idea, it has to be a close relative to them. And so how does this all relate to Naomi and Ruth? What does this kinsman redeemer have to do in their scenario? We have to remember that Elimelech was from the line of Judah. And way back in Genesis 49, Jacob prophesies and says about Judah, Judah, from your tribe, from your family, you will always have the scepter of a king in your family. Your family will be the kingdom line until the one comes who's anointed, who has kingdom, who has dominion, who has authority, which is Messiah. So Elimelech's line is bringing this Messiah through, and if no one redeems them, the name dies, the land dies. But we have to remember that God is good, right? And God is faithful, right? And so unbeknownst to Naomi and Ruth, God is working behind the scenes. Pastor Brian mentioned it the last two weeks that God's faithfulness is all over this entire book of Ruth. It is him weaving the, all these pieces together. Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz are separately living their lives, but God is orchestrating behind the scenes to make sure that they are taken care of, to make sure that he is faithful to his promises, and to never allow anybody to stop what he's doing in the world by bringing his promised Messiah through. And so a kinsman redeemer was needed to provide rest for Naomi as well as Ruth. And a, Ruth agrees to do exactly what Naomi says and approach Boaz at his feet. And we're going to see that she is about to find out that rest is found in our kinsman redeemer. Look at verses 6 through 13. It'll be on the screen. She sa it says this, So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her, and when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And here in this book, when you see a behold, or when you see it just so happened, 
This is the author, this, this is the sense it have. God is making this happen. So when you see behold here, it's, wow, this isn't just, oh, coincidence like Pastor Brian talked about. This is God working to show Ruth and Naomi something and to show us something. So it says, behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. I don't know how Ruth slept that night. I don't even know if she could sleep that night hearing all of that, all of her dreams, her wish, her desire could possibly be coming true. How could you possibly find rest in that moment? But here Ruth does everything that Naomi has instructed her to do. Boaz is sleeping at the grain heap outside of the city gates, sleeping there trying to watch over his stuff to make sure nobody sees it. And then Boaz wakes up startled and he sees this woman lying at his feet. And the first thing she says is, I'm Ruth, your servant, and spread your wings over me. Now, how many of you have no idea what spread your wings over me means? Fantastic, because I had to look it up too this week. And so here's what happens. The word for spread your wings, the words for wings there, is also the Hebrew word for garments. And what's also good as we study scripture, as we read it, is to find out where that word is used elsewhere. And if we look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8, we're going to see this same word is used there. So let's get context so we can understand what it means here. And here's what it says. When I passed by, talking about God, when I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age of love, and I spread the corner of my garment or wings over you, and covered your nakedness. Why is that? I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. What's the picture here? This is the picture of a husband taking his bride into his home. A covenant that God made with Israel, where Israel became his bride, it became his beloved, where God would protect them, where God would provide for them, where God would provide comfort, security, and God would provide rest for his people. So flash forward to Ruth, what is happening to Ruth. What Ruth is asking Boaz to do is she is doing a marriage proposal. When she says, spread your garments over me, spread your wings, she's saying, would you, Boaz, marry me. Now we live in a culture that says the man should be the one to ask the proposal. But here's the custom. Back then, if an older man was interested in a younger woman, he would never ask her to marry him. The younger woman had to go to the man. So here you have Boaz, this faithful man of God, this man who obeyed the customs, never asked. He could have been interested in her. I mean, he did ask, who's that servant over here in the fields but here Ruth is coming to him saying would you marry me and Boaz sees her faithfulness and says this faithfulness you're showing now is greater than your last faithfulness to follow Naomi everywhere she went to turn from her gods and to turn away that this is a greater act of kindness and why is Boaz saying that that this is a greater sacrifice for Ruth Because here's what you have to understand when when Ruth marries Boaz. Boaz and Ruth are not going to be propagating their own name. Their descendants are Elimelech's and Naomi's line. The child that Ruth conceives belongs to the line of Elimelech. So here, this is what Boaz says. You could have went after any man, Ruth. You could have gone after anyone, the rich, the poor, but I see you were faithful to God. You were faithful to his words to know what the law says. You who were a Gentile, a Moabite, but you understood God's word and were faithful to do it. And because of that, he says, I will redeem you. But because Boaz 
is also a faithful man. In chapter 2, he's called a worthy man. And Ruth here is called a worthy woman. And because he's faithful, he says, look, I want to marry you, but there is one closer than I. And I'm going to have to ask him if he would like to marry you first. The next morning, Boaz gives Ruth the gift, and Ruth goes home to Naomi. And of course, Naomi wants to know all about it. What happened, Ruth? What happened? What happened? Right? And so Ruth tells her in verse 17 of chapter 3, she says, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back, what are those next two words? Empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Why is that important? You may not remember but in chapter one, when the tragedy struck and she lost, Naomi lost her husband, her daughter-in-law's lost her husband, she lost her sons, she said, the Lord, I, I walked away full and the Lord brought me back empty-handed. So why is Boaz giving her this note of I have not given you back empty-handed? This is God wanting Naomi to know I didn't forget about you. In your greatest tragedy, where you said, change my name from Naomi, meaning pleasant, and change it to Mara, meaning bitter, in your bitterness, Naomi, I never walked away from you. In your tragedy, I never left. I didn't operate on your time, but here's how God works. God's timing is always at the right time, And it's always every time when he brings us the grace and the mercy that we need. And here, when Boaz mentions those words, it's a reminder to Naomi, your God in heaven has not forgotten about you, has not forgotten about your family, and has not forgotten about his promises that he has made. And so Boaz gives her these words of encouragement. And Naomi, at this point, is realizing rest is coming soon. And so upon hearing these words, she knows rest is coming, and what we see in the rest of Scripture is she tells Naomi, she tells Ruth, she goes, look, I know that the things that Boaz has told you, he's not going to wait on this. And sure enough, you get to chapter 4, and right away you see Boaz is already down there at the gate. And the gate was a place where politics was done, it was a place where debates were done, and it was a place where law transactions were done. And he calls ten elders to sit there with him. And it says as he's sitting there, behold, the kinsman redeemer came by. Again, noting, God brings this kinsman redeemer by, and Boaz says, okay, here's, the, here's Ruth. Do you want a redeemer? Do you want to take the land of Elimelech and keep it going? And at first he's like, yep, I'll redeem her. I'll redeem the land. And he goes, okay, now if you redeem the land, then you also have to take Ruth the Moabite, Israel's hated enemy, you have to take her as your wife. And at that point, the kinsman redeemer said, I'm out. I'm not willing to pay the price. And he says, look, I don't want to interrupt my own family name, and I don't want to interrupt my inheritance that I have for my family. My inheritance is going to my family. I don't want it to go into Elimelech. So you know what? I'm done. You can go ahead and redeem Ruth yourself. So Boaz stands before the elders, and the, the other kinsman redeemer, he takes off a sandal, and he seals the deal and hands it to Boaz, and that was basically saying, I'm not going to do it. You now have the right to take the name, to take the land, and have Ruth as your wife. And so Boaz stands up in front of all the elders, in front of all the witnesses there, and look at what he says in verse 10 of chapter 4. Also Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of Milan, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses to this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. In this moment, Boaz takes Ruth as his wife. And in this moment, Ruth and Naomi find out that rest is found in their kinsman redeemer. Boaz and Ruth were willing to obey God's faithful commands and God's faithfulness brought them together. Ruth conceives and gives birth to a child and this is a special child 
And what's so special about this child? You are going to have to come back next Sunday to find out. Because I'm not telling you, Pastor Brian is. But we only have a few more minutes and then we'll be done this morning. So sit tight. So God brought rest to Naomi and Ruth. They were brought into a family where they would experience comfort, rest, and security. And here's what I want you to know today, church, is that that same rest is available to each and every single one of us in this room today. No matter what you are enduring, no matter how difficult and hard life gets for you, no matter how much you cry, no matter how bitter you get, no matter how frustrated you feel, rest is available to you. And God is telling you, just like he told Naomi, I have not left you empty-handed. I've heard so many times, and I know Pastor Brian has heard so many times from so many people, that when tragedy strikes, if God was good, that wouldn't have happened. And because it happened, God is not good, and I turn my back on God and run away. God didn't cause the tragedies in your life to happen. You know what causes that? Sin and brokenness in the world. Scriptures say every good gift comes from your Father who is in heaven. And so just because your circumstances stink doesn't mean God stinks. God is still good in your junk. God is still good in your mess. God is still good when terrible things happen to you, and he doesn't leave any of us empty-handed. You see, the problem that we have is we want God to work on our time when we want him to work. Instead of realizing that God works in his time at the right time every time. And his rest is available to us and our rest is found in our kinsman redeemer. At some point to Jesus as the kinsman redeemer, the true kinsman redeemer. And so we're going to put aside the book of Ruth for this moment. In this moment we're going to look at some New Testament passages to show us that rest is found in Jesus and he is our kinsman redeemer. Just like Ruth, she was stuck in a situation that she was incapable of getting herself out. She couldn't buy land. She couldn't keep the family name going. She needed somebody else to step in and do what she couldn't. Here's what the scriptures say about every single one of us in Ephesians 2.1. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. All of us were stuck in slavery to sin, to the powers of this world, to do whatever our evil desires want us to do. And here we are in desperate need of somebody purchasing us out of that slavery. And this is what our kinsman redeemer does. We need someone to step in and do for us what we can't do for ourselves. There is nobody in here that could sit back and say, if I do a thousand good works and only three bad things, that's going to get me to heaven. It's not going to happen. It's not based upon what you do. It's based upon what God has done through the person and work of Jesus Christ and through his death and through his resurrection. And so here Jesus is the kinsman redeemer and how is he a kinsman? How is he related to us? Look what Hebrew says. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Why is that? So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. For what purpose? To make propitiation for the sins of God the people. Jesus became like man to pay for our sins, to take our sins, and break us out of our slavery to sin. Not only was he a relative and close to us, he was also willing to pay the price for us. Look at 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with what? The precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus paid the ultimate price so that he, you could be welcomed into his family. It cost him his life. His blood was spilt so that he could redeem us. He could call us his children where he would be our God and we would be his people and we would know the comfort and security of being his bride. 
not only was he willing to pay the price, but he was wanting to redeem us and willing to redeem us. Look at what John 10, 15 says. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And the sheep are his people. And he says, and not only just for the people of Israel, I'm laying down for my, my life for, there's other sheep this, the rest of the entire world, all nations, all tongues, all tribes, I am laying my life so that they would know me and know my rest. And look at what Jesus does to us as our kinsman redeemer. He brings us into his family. Look at 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us where? To God. To where God lives, to where God's home is. If you remember, Jesus said, when he's about to leave his disciples, I go to my father's house, right? And in my father's house are what? Many rooms. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. Why? Because it's comfort, it's security, it's rest found in God as he takes us as his bride. You see, rest is found in our kinsman redeemer. And Jesus told his disciples and told anybody willing to listen And it's telling us today, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Jesus invites everyone, doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or who you've done it with. The call is the same to everybody. If you respond to Jesus in faith, no matter who you are, his rest will come to you, and he will take you as his family. You will be a child of God and you will experience the comfort and security that he provides. And here's where the comfort and security comes. It doesn't come in the sense of rest means that I'm never going to face difficulty in life. It doesn't mean that when God gives me rest, that I'm never going to have a difficult tragedy that happens. No, no, no. Here's what rest means. That even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. Why is that? For your God is with you. You see, for Kelly and I, I alluded to it earlier, 2019 has been a difficult year for us. And so we started off where Kelly's uncle passed away. Then her grandmother unexpectedly passed away. Then several weeks ago, my uncle passed away unexpectedly. And then we go on a trip to Thanksgiving, and while we're there on Thanksgiving, one of my family members has a mental health breakdown. We have to admit him into the behavioral unit at the hospital because of possibly taking his own life. And so we're sitting back in the tiredness and the craziness and it was four days of chaos and struggle and pain. And I remember Kelly and I talking, I'm like, we just want to get out of North Carolina, like just just run away, like just get away from all this because we were emotionally tired, we were mentally tired, we were physically tired. But as we were talking, I said, but Kelly, the one thing that we can't be is we can't be spiritually tired. And I just said, Kelly, you know what we have to do? In the midst of all this stuff, junk we have to remember that God is good and God is faithful and that became our rock and our anchor so even when it got crazy even when I wanted to like throw stuff and break stuff and punch stuff and even if I wanted to like go around just uh, scream into the air I just always had to go back to even as crazy as I know God is good and I know God is faithful and somehow He's going to work good out of it. Even if I never live to see it, he is good and he is faithful. Last week I had somebody call me and say, hey, panicked. I can't find a school for my daughter. No school would take her. No school is willing to provide the services. And so I'm on the phone with him. And I don't know if you ever had this kind of interaction. I'm trying to give suggestions and what about this and what about that. You ever get in a conversation where you realize you're not helping because everything you say they've already tried? And so he just got more and more flustered. And at some point I realized, like, I'm not helping. I am literally making this worse. So I said, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. I said, we're just going to sit back and remember that God is good and God is faithful And I said, we're going to pray, and we're just going to ask God to do something. And so we prayed, and in the midst of the prayer, it was just simple. God, we know you see what he's going through. God, you know you see his heart. You see his faithfulness. And God, we're just asking that you lead her to the right school, because we know you're good, and we know you're faithful. Amen. I go about the rest of my night. The next day, he calls me and says, you won't believe it. 
Brad. There was this piece of paper I had from another school that denied us. I called this one school on there, and that school says, oh, we provide all the services for your daughter. We can take her. We can take her on a scholarship. It's not even going to be that expensive. You can come, and she can start right away. And he said, Brad, you prayed that God would lead me to a school, and he did. God is good. Okay? So why do I share that? Why do I share that? Because rest is available to us, and it doesn't mean we'll never have struggles. But we can find that anchor in realizing, no matter how hard life's, life gets, when you fall on your knees, and when you've ex- exhausted all of your effort to try to fix and hold on and be strong, when you just stop and bow your knee and say, God, through it all, you are good. Through it all, you are faithful. There's a peace of mind that comes across your heart and your soul. And this is what it means to have our hearts guarded through Jesus Christ and in his peace. Because he's in control. He's got it all figured out. He sees the whole picture. All we have is a one-piece puzzle and a bazillion times infinity puzzle. We don't even get, we just think this one piece is all there is, but he's got the whole picture painted. He knows how it's all going to work out. And he says, find rest in Christ, not in our circumstances. And so this morning, here's what I want to get across as we close. Today, you've never given your life to Christ. Today, Jesus is saying, look, if you are tired of running around exhausted, if you're tired of running around trying to fix life yourself and trying to do it on your own, he's telling you, come, all who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Your soul will be at rest. And he will welcome you into his family and you will be his bride and he will take care of you like the perfect husband he is. So if that's you today, I encourage you in the quietness of your heart or you can come to the altar and just declare, Jesus, you are Lord. I believe in you. I come to you. Give me rest. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are Lord and King of this earth. And I pray that you would do that today. But for others of us, if there's a burden, I know Pastor Brian mentioned it earlier, who's got a burden in their heart and all the hands that went up in the room. For some of us, it might just be, hey, you know what? I need to go to the altar and I just need to cry out, God, my rest is in you. God, you're good. God, you're faithful and give me the grace and mercy I need to get up off my feet every day and still do what you've called me to do. And so as the worship team comes out and as they sing for us, I just pray that you would do as God would lead you to do. So would you join with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and your grace. Father, you know the burdens that each of us carry. Father, you know how weary it makes each and every single one of us. But yet, Father, we also know the truth that when we fall at the mercy of your feet, you respond in grace and love, forgiveness and mercy. And Father, we also know that in the midst of our greatest tragedy and struggles, that you are our hope because you are good and you are faithful. So Lord, we give you all the praise and glory forevermore. Amen.